Uh, welcome to Authentic Falconer. My name is Mike Bordenero, and I'm sitting here with uh, Joe Atkinson and Cordy Atkinson. And I'm very, very happy that they agreed to do this. We're going to go over um, about their Egan, eagle falconry. Uh, they trained eagles since 1976. Long time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they've also trained the uh, one of the rarest eagles in the world. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and they also fly and train um, birds of prey for... Uh, film, television, TV, National Geographic, and uh, lots of good stuff. And probably one thing that I've noticed just by hanging out with them, uh, they're, they definitely have the conservationism instilled in them. They just love animals. And we're going to talk about that side as well because it is very important dealing with nature. But um, So one more thing, Joe Atkinson's EagleJournal.com is his website. So I urge you guys to check that out. He has lots of good articles and stuff and information on what he does. And uh, there's even DVDs and training things for sale on there as well if you are interested. So if we're going to jump right in. I want to start with um, your journey into falconry, how you got into that. And uh, maybe you can... Boy, that was a little while ago. Um, my grandfather, who loved horses, wagons, circus wagons, all that, anyway, always had ranches. He told me one day that he saw a little falcon carrying a mouse and it went down a hole in a tree. And that sparked my interest a lot. So obviously it was a kestrel. And so I got the brilliant idea to go get climbing spikes. Mm -hmm. And nobody told me that there's tree climbing spikes and pole climbing <laughs> spikes, and they're vastly different. I just went down to Army Surplus. I didn't. I was young, wasn't driving, but begged my father or somebody to take me down there. Mm -hmm. Bought a pair of spikes, tied them on my legs with rope, <laughs> and thought, this is great. I'm just going <laughs> to climb right up there. Yeah. Well, I fell out of the tree. And then somebody told me, you need to have a, a rope around the tree attached around your belly so that it keeps you the tree. Okay, well, apparently when you do that and you lean forward, the spikes come out <laughs> and you can't get away from the tree, so you fall right down the tree. And I did that, and one of the spikes went right through my big toe. So that didn't work out so well. So my next brilliant idea was I'm going to make a ladder. I'm just going to hammer <laughs> the steps into the tree oh my gosh. and get up there. So I eventually did that. I got up there. I had to enlarge the hole. I could barely stick my arm down there, and one little kestrel footed me, and mm. I pulled it out. It was a male, and I took him home and raised him, and his name was Chief. Chief. And I thought he loved me, you know, because, well, I raised him. And yeah. So I took him out and flew him the first time, flew off, never saw him again. <laughs> <laughs> and I was uh, crushed. <laughs> uh, how old were you? Oh, boy, I was uh, seventh or eighth grade or something okay. like that, you know, maybe sixth grade. But, yeah, no, I, I read My Side of the Mountain, mm. and I was pretty sure that this bird just had this attachment to me. And, and I mean, he literally blew off the fist, and I never saw him again. <laughs> that was the first clue as to the obsession yeah. with falconry. Yeah. Still <clears throat> kind of broke up about that. <laughs> but, uh, Do you remember your sponsor? Um and how involved he was? Or there was no sponsors. Back nothing back then. Nah. It's just, wow. You just, all the books you got, and I was interested in, in all facets, but were all written you know, from the perspective in England. So really none of the, you know, the basic rules of falconry applied, but if there was something wrong with your bird or you needed to do anything medically, it was all you know, in England. You know, it didn't mm. apply here. Yeah, and and there was nobody to go to, um, and so yeah, it was you're pretty much on your own. Yeah, trial and error. Trial and error, mm. and there was a lot of errors. <laughs> <laughs> when did uh, when did you get in, involved with uh, the birds, Cordy? I got into it by default because <laughs> of Joe. I mean, I I I love all animals, but um, you know, I had not had this close contact with birds of prey until Joe and I met. And um, when we were in college, um, we lived on the outskirts of San Jose on one of Joe's family's ranches. And that's when we started to kind of accumulate 
some birds of prey. I, I even had my own kestrel whose name was Thor. <laughs> um, but that's how I got into it. And I, you know, just, just because of my love of animals. Sure. And um, since Joe's <clears throat> told everyone about what happened to his first ke kestrel, my poor little Thor, I flew him out on the ranch and only to see a pair of red tails gang up on him. One mm. was a decoy, and then the other one came in and snatched him out of the air and flew off with him, and that was the end of Thor. Broke my heart. Yeah, mm. <laughs> those kestrels, boy, they're... But, the, but he, um, he, he would only hunt grasshoppers. Oh, I've heard yeah. of those. Yep. Fierce, <laughs> so, fierce hunters, yes, yeah. Fierce. <laughs> well, so. grasshopper's a good flight now, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But that's, yeah, that's how I got into it. So, yep. Drug you along. He, yeah. <laughs> You're pretty into the conservation side, though, too, right? Oh, very much so. Um, you know, we, we are very aware of the interaction between animals and people and their habitat and um, the challenges presented by man. Um, I mean, you know, like our golden eagles, they're only... Um, well, they don't have any predators. They're the mm. king of the mountain, so to speak, king of the queen of the sky. And all of their challenges are caused by man. And that is something that we try and educate about. Um, and we've done a lot of rehabilitation work with young golden eagles. Um, we, we go to hunter safety classes to teach kids about uh, the harm harm that lead causes if they use mm. lead shot and so on so yeah we're um lead's we, a huge problem a huge problem yeah it's probably the biggest challenge to golden eagles because um people go out and shoot for recreation they use lead they leave carcasses uh laying out and you know of course a bird of prey is going to come down and take advantage of that food source yeah. especially if they're feeding young and then Pretty soon, they all have lead poisoning, and it's a horrible way to die. Horrible, and um, very sad. And has become one of our main focuses on educating people. Mm. That's really good. Um, so you guys also do eagle releasing out into the wild. You get these rehab eagles, and um, I remember reading about some point where. They were releasing them, and they just didn't have the history or the background at the time to follow them up and see how they were doing. Right. And they were finding out that these eagles weren't doing well after being released. Mm -hmm. So obviously you guys are a big part of involving that change and putting those implements into play. So could you talk about what it is it would take to um, take a rehab eagle and make it so it would be able to be sustaining out by itself? Yeah, the, the thing that we found was that young golden eagles come in, let's say they're not hard pin or just barely hard pin. They come into a rehab center for whatever reason. And, you know, they're fixed up, they're deemed medically, physically fit. And then people in the past, and they still do, feel that that bird can just be turned loose. It's an eagle. It knows how to do everything. And they don't understand how much parental guidance and care they get, they receive, they receive after they leave the nest. And our whole program, the bulk of it was done in California, and I trained and released dozens, dozens. I don't even know. I couldn't even tell you how many eagles, really. And I would hunt them off the fist, and I had a benchmark that each eagle had to catch 12 head of wild game, particularly jackrabbits. And if it could do that, I felt pretty confident that they were able to survive in the wild. And in California, they, they probably can. But our whole focus has evolved into realizing that the single most important thing a young golden eagle needs to learn to do is soar. And they, it's, you know, fish and wildlife officials have said it's hardwired in an eagle. They know how to soar. Well, the way, yes, physically they're built to soar, but it's the mental part. And if you watch, you have the opportunity to watch raptors, in this case golden eagles, the babies will actually follow the parents up into thermals because they want to be fed. So they're haranguing the parents, but they're learning how to soar. 
And a young golden eagle is just not going to leave a side of a hill and catch a thermal. They need to be able to practice that. In time, they'll learn it. But my point is, is when you turn a young bird loose out of a rehab that's perfectly healthy, it doesn't have time to learn to soar. What it needs to do is eat. And if it can't okay. soar, it's not going to find food. Mm -hmm. Some say, oh, yeah, well, it can slope soar. But if there's no food on that slope, what's it going to do? Is it going to fly 20 miles across the open valley? And look, no, it, it's not going to do that. So our whole focus has evolved into with falconers that are flying rehab eagles is, yes, hunt them off the fist, get them catching game, but they have to be able to soar, just like we did with Widow today. You know, she covered 50 miles over our head, circling around. She has, being up that high, she can rob from other raptors. She can find carrion. She can find water. And she's not expending critically necessary energy. So soaring is the thing that we've found. So we've evolved into that. And all of the falconers in our program um, are soaring birds up to two hours. And it's become very evident to us how important it is for them to have, uh, if they don't have the chance to learn it from their parents, to be given that opportunity. Because we've, we've seen young eagles just act, actually panic when a thermal picks them up. Because you know, mm -hmm. they don't have um, the control you know, to jump off of it or whatever. And they actually panic. And they get sucked up into the sky and then We've literally had them look down at us like, okay, what am I supposed to do now? There was one in particular got pulled up into a thermal, and two hours later, he finally made his way back to us, and he was so tired that all he, he, he glided down to the nearest hill range and just landed, and that was it. He was done, and we had to hike up there and, and, you know, and get him back. But it's so important, and it's mind-boggling to us that people don't consider that. And, I mean, almost every animal has that learning period with their parents, and why um, officials within Fish and Wildlife and in um, state agencies, why they don't understand that eagles are in that same uh, category and need that time with their parents, you mm -hmm. know. Um, it's just amazing to us, and we've had some uh, pretty heated discussions, <laughs> I guess you could say, yeah. uh, trying to, uh. you know, um, have get them to understand the importance, and um, it's it's been an uphill battle, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. As much yeah. as I like to hunt golden eagles off the fist, soaring is the most critical thing you can. Offer even if the bird, even if you don't hunt it at all, you just get it thermal soaring. It's going up five, six thousand feet, whatever they want to do. Yeah, that bird now has the opportunity to go anywhere it wants to go, and mm -hmm. see what it needs to see. And the eagles will trigger on. I, I, I don't ever remember any of the eagles I ever flew not triggering, triggering when they see like a red tail or a marsh hawk go down on something. Boy, they want to know because. You know, that's the way it is. Yeah. Red tails rob from kestrels. Kestrel, you know, it's just the, the mm -hmm. hierarchy. And so that's innately in them. But if they're not in the air, uh, yeah. the world is a very scary place. For yeah. Them. For example, you know, birds have, golden eagles, young golden eagles have been released in wooded areas without any um, education, if you want to call it that. So not being able to soar they're not able to get up above the trees. There aren't jackrabbits in the trees. Yeah. And which is their main prey. I mean, they, they are able to adapt, but you're talking about a young bird that needs every advantage it can get. And not being able to soar and get above the trees and reach a flatland or the plains, you know, where uh, their natural habitat is, these birds starve to death. And that um, bird had satellite tracking on it. Yeah, so and that it, was documented. That that's just the mm -hmm. rehabber turned it loose. Well, there's there's eagles around here. They're bald eagles. Yeah, you know, it was up in Washington uh, or northern Idaho in a basically a forest, and thought this eagle would be fine. 
and it just flew around from tree to tree till it dropped dead of starvation. You know, it's frustrating. I know it's, yeah. it's incredibly yeah. frustrating. That's a bird that deserved the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's to at kind least of live something. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And that's our driving force. Is it's unfortunate that these birds have ended up in captivity, but you know they've been nursed back to health, um, and they all deserve an opportunity to become a wild eagle again. You know that there are some that. Um, become too imprinted, can't be released, or some that have injuries that prohibit them from being released. But the rest of them, they deserve that opportunity because mm-hmm. living know, in captivity is not a great life for them. For no. me, you know, I've been asked a lot of times, why do you do this? Because nobody pays us to rehab eagles. They don't, not getting checks from the feds to cover the quail expense and all that. <laughs> but for me personally, and I know Cordy feels the same way, as you're training a young eagle, and, and we were talking about this earlier, where the eagles we get are pretty pissed off about people because for all the right reasons, they've been chased around in cages, netted, given shots, all these things for their own good. They don't know that, of course. So when we get them, it's a big hurdle to get them to calm down and trust you enough to be able to fly it. So then, you know, you get past all that and you start to fly the bird and usually they're pretty frustrated because all of their instincts have been, you know, roadblocks. They can't fly the way they want. They can't, they don't, because they don't even know they're an eagle for the most part. So what happens is, you know, I get them to the point where I'm hunting them. And when they make their first kill, when they catch their first jackrabbit, you can see the light go on in their eyes. And, and it's literally, you can see them thinking, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is my destiny. I am a hunter, and I just, and to me, that is one of the most gratifying things because the goal is to get them back in the wild. And when you take them from catching stuff off the fist and then you start soaring them and you start flushing game for them, they become more independent. You can see them pulling away. And as a falconer, if that was a falconry bird, I don't want them pulling away because I don't, you know, want them flying yeah, off. Sure. But as a rehab bird, you can see that whole their body language mm-hmm. changes. That's why I do it mm-hmm. because you know whether they're going to live or die is I want them to make those choices. Yeah. So you're going to be a free eagle, and the best thing you can do is stay as far away from people as possible. But if you die out there, it's because you were making those choices and you had an opportunity, and so. You know that's what motivates us. Um, what's the What's the main reason you guys get them? Like, why are these well, they eagles come, in rehab? They don't come directly to us. They come into rehabs, and there's we work with two rehab people extensive. Oh, and by the way, the wonderful state of Oregon has shut down eagle rehabbing. Yeah. People flying eagles, falconers flying eagles for rehab. It's not going to happen. They don't think it's necessary. They would just rather have these birds starve to death or turn loose. So that's a whole different stuff. You've got another hour and a half. Hmm. We, what we're doing now is we're consulting with two different rehabbers, big ones that get a lot of eagles in, and we're helping find falconers that can fly them. We vet the falconers um, because it's a commitment. Not every fit. There's some as we both know, all of us, there's great falconers out there. Yeah. There's not every falconer that wants to put that kind of time in to commit to training a bird and then getting it flying at a high level and turning it loose. Well, and there aren't many falconers with experience flying golden eagles. Yeah, That's a whole nother issue because they're in a class all their own. It's not like flying a big red tail yeah. or flying we get that all the time. big Harris's Oh, I'm flying a huge female yeah. red tail. I know how to handle big birds. No, you yeah. don't understand. No, they are in a class all their own. And um, in order to do a good job with them, you, you need an experienced falconer, you know, eagle falconer. Yeah. And um, those are um, hard to find. There's new guys coming online and gals which is good. But, you know, the thing about eagles is if you're not careful, they will send you to the hospital. Yeah, I know your big red tail can grab you, your big female hair or whatever. It's not the same. Golden eagle grabs you. you got a serious problem. It will, you will get away from it when it decides to let go of you. And so 
So each person has to understand their level of desire to fly this bird. And yeah. I know guys that would make wonderful eagle falconers. They don't want to even go near an eagle. Yeah. They don't want to take the chance. And I get that. So it's not a macho thing, but we would be doing somebody listening to this a disservice if we didn't say, if you get footed, you gotta, you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not going to die, but <laughs> it's well, going to hurt. <laughs> well, and the whole goal is to eventually turn these birds loose. So you, you, like when Joe said that he bets the falconers in the program, um, you have to know that they will actually go through the protocol, fly them, not end up, you know, because of lack of experience or whatever, that they end up just kind of manning the bird and showing it to people. And, you know, and that's a whole yeah. other criteria is the uh, minimal contact with people. And some of these concepts are really hard to get people to follow. We've um, had falconers say, well, if you give me a bird and I fly it for a year or two, I'm not, I'm not giving it back. I'm not turning it loose. Oh, actually, you are. Well, it's, I, yeah, because <laughs> yeah. that's the, what you're doing. Or the feds are coming to your door. Well, yeah. another person said, well, I, I um, imprinted it. Or yeah. I'm trying to imprint it, so then you can't make me turn it loose. You know, the, these are the, the mm. people so that you have to... So we immediately take that bird back. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's yeah. not the, you know... That's not the goal. No. For, this is no. all about the birds. It's not about making a falconry bird. And it's not up to us. Yeah. No. It's not like we have control over the bird. We are just, you know, the rehabber really doesn't have that much control. The feds, if the rehabber called the feds up and said, so-and-so is trying to imprint this bird, we don't think it's a good situation, they're going to come do something about it. Yeah. yeah. You know, so there's a lot of, it's, it's a great program, but it's not for everyone. you got to live in a place where you have yeah. access to game, where you have access mm-hmm. to hills and all that. Not everyone yeah, has Yeah, again, because of the ultimate goal is to release the bird. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about the flip side. What about a falconer who wants to get a golden eagle? How easy is that? Well, it's, impo- <laughs> it's nearly impossible. Nearly, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the feds would say the golden eagle populations are down. The research biologists will say that's hogwash. Um, there's tons and tons of golden eagle, and they're pretty stable. Not everybody wants a golden eagle, so it's not like if they said, okay, golden eagles... We're going to just lump them into the same class as red tails in terms of falconry, and anybody that traps one can get one. I would be shocked if 20 people in the United States did that. There's Mm -hmm. going to be people that will trap it and realize how hard they can squeeze and then turn it loose. Yeah, You know, there's there's going to be that. But now they got a lottery system, um, which has been a long time coming. And you can trap a depredating eagle that's eating sheep and wherever. Utah, mm-hmm. Wyoming, and you have to, but you have to be drawn, um, and so it's there's a lot of hoops. The bottom line is, if you get a golden eagle, it is the most irreplaceable bird in falconry because you can't get another one. The chances of getting another one are zero. So yeah. you better make it good on the first shot. And, and it's the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has made it very difficult. Um, in our experience too, with with just the rehab eagles, you know, you, you you jump through one hoop that they tell you, oh no, you you know, you need to do this. Okay, so we do it, and then there's another roadblock, and so on and so on. Um, so they right now in the lottery, there are only six golden eagles that can be trapped, mm-hmm. and and the reason given is that you know the numbers are down and you know, so on and so forth. But yet, wind turbines kill them by the hundreds with no consequence. Mm-hmm. Um, they are still shot, shot by ranchers, shot for fun. fun. Um, you know, they have all these challenges that are killing them and, not, you know, all legally, I guess you could say, or, well, shooting is not legal, but... Can't have one in the hands of a falconer. No, but you can't have one in the hands of a falconer because that's you know, bad. Yeah, the numbers are down, if, and you can't do that. If they would just um, let us breed eagles, golden eagles in captivity, in terms of fish and wildlife, all their problems would be solved. 
Yeah. Because probably in five years, if we were if we were breeding eagles, which we're not, we were breeding eagles. I would say in five years, I would be begging people to take them. Yeah. There aren't there's there's just aren't many because there's yeah. too many limitations. It's probably yeah. the best falconry bird you could ever fly if you do it, you know, correctly. But not that every not everyone has that opportunity. Yeah. You know, it's just, you're not going to be car hawking your golden eagle. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but, and we're fortunate that we, and, and this is one of the reasons we moved to Vail, um, because of all the BLM access. You know, we have all this public land. And just for the record, there's no jackrabbits in Vail. <laughs> <laughs> They've been extinct. So yeah. let's just make that clear. <laughs> uh, no, but you need the, the right habitat to hmm. successfully fly a golden eagle and hunt with it. So um, right there is a huge limitation. Very true. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's talk about um, today. We went out and we got to see Widow fly. Joe and I went out to see uh, her go up, and I was like kind of hear your impressions. Yeah, actually, uh, I was going to give a little breakdown because I was very impressed. So as soon as we got out, um, the dogs were cut loose, and they were we were waiting. Everyone was waiting until the bird was up in place, and she just took her time and waited till she saw something she liked and went up yeah. and up, up, up. She soared up and, um, you know, she was going quite a ways away and I wasn't sure what to expect because uh, <laughs> yeah, she kept going away. farther and farther <laughs> the opposite way. 1.4. Yeah, over a mile away. Yeah. And uh, Joe was not like concerned, so I wasn't concerned. I was looking at him to see his reaction. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't and get he was me. like, this is normal. So, yeah, yeah. you know, and sure enough, she circled back and, you know, she was above us, and then all three dogs went out, and it was incredible how they all worked as a team, and they would stop. The dogs were great. I mean, they weren't just off doing their own thing. They they were on their commands, and they weren't flushing when they weren't supposed to. Right. So um, it was really cool to see it happen. And then how she would just come up, and I'd see her shadow above us when That's I wouldn't. That's the part I love. Yeah, when I wouldn't know where she was, but then i just see her shadow go in front of me, <laughs> be like, oh, there she is. Yeah. She's waiting for us. Like a giant shark. Yeah, and we busted some jacks. Your dog's got some jacks out for her, and we saw a couple good stoops. And uh, very close. One of them was really close in front of us, and I was hoping she was going to get lucky yeah. today. But uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen. But I had a great time. And uh, well, yeah. Some of the best flights are when you don't catch anything. Yeah. You know, you're out there in nature, you're seeing the lizards. Oh, um, we lizards. saw the lizards. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, and earlier in the year, you know, in the. In Spring, we see the wildflowers out there, and it's just so cool to be out there. There's nobody around, and um, you know, and watch the dogs work, watch her fly. And what I love is, I don't know if any of the dogs did it today, but sometimes, like especially Ziva, she will stop and she actually looks up in the sky yeah, to looks see for where the eagle. The, really, yeah, 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 looks for the eagle. That's I mean, funny. they really have a yeah. team effort going. They do. And uh, it's yeah. pretty incredible. Because at home, these dogs don't mind us <laughs> at all. You go, yeah, they're, yeah, we laugh about them. But um, you I think go I out could, there, and they're all business. They I know, could drive yeah. up there, turn the eagle loose, jump the dogs up, out, and just stand by the truck. And I think the dogs and the eagle would go do their thing. Yeah, <laughs> just might be a mile away. Right. Yeah, that's true. So we flew Widow. You have other... Um, Goldens and we do. what is their what are the different various styles that they hunt? Because I know well, Widow's the only soaring eagle we have. The other ones are off the fist. Okay, and um, that's I love that hawking as well um, because you know the eagle is very involved with the hunting process. It's looking for the rabbits, and mm -hmm. they react so quickly when a rabbit flushes. It's it's we've had folks long time German goshawk flying people that just started to jump up and down saying, that eagle's faster off the fist than my goshawk. <laughs> they are extremely oh fast. Whether they're faster than the goshawk, I don't know. But yeah. they, I've had a lot of goshawk guys tell me that they're as fast. So that's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, for a bird that size to generate that kind yeah. of speed and agility so quickly. It's, and it's, it's deceiving because, you know, they're so big that uh, the, the yeah. wingspan, but boy, um, they, they cover the ground, yeah. yeah. And I was telling you earlier, one thing I love, but there's a lot of things I love about Golden Eagle, they don't like to get beat. Mm -hmm. And Jackhammer in particular, um, 
the rabbit beats her a couple of times and she comes, I can just see a whole change in her <laughs> body language. And I've said this a million, the next rabbit gets up, it's got a serious problem because his <laughs> eagle is, is dialed. But uh, yeah, so we, you know, uh, the eagles we have are, have been, we've acquired over the years, many years ago, um, our imprints. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, like, <laughs> like we have some that are certifiably insane. I'll tell you a quick story. I, I, <laughs> my friends, all my Eagle Falconer friends know me mainly and they get a chuckle out of this because I end up getting psycho Eagles, Eagles that have come through rehab that were imprinted by mistake and are just trying, their first reaction is to foot you in the face. So I've been dealing yeah. with that for years. We went to the Middle East and uh, to the International Falconry Festival. Um, I was there with a, in a, on an eight-man international team of eagle handlers, and Cordy was there to film the whole thing for a promotional documentary. <laughs> so they're all like, okay, well, you get this eagle, and, that, and Joe, you get that one over there. That's Queenie. <laughs> oh, she looks like an iceberg. <laughs> Queenie's a barracoot, which is the largest species of eagles. And she was domestically raised, and she came from Germany. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> as time went on, they were le letting out little snippets of information. I said, well, tell me a little bit more about Queenie. I changed her name to the gargoyle, <laughs> just to let you know. Yeah. So the story I was told was Queenie's first flight in a, in a situation, exhibition situation, she flew off the guy's fist, went up into the, and this is in the UAE, went up into the audience and killed a cat. And, wow. <laughs> and I was thinking, what? Well, there's cats running all over the place. We've come to find out. Uh -huh. Okay. Her next flight, she did the same thing, but killed a goat. Wow. The third flight, she took the handler down, pinned him on the ground, and sent him to the hospital. Ooh. And I'm thinking, Queenie? This is <laughs> <laughs> So I trained her, and she wasn't that bad a bird. wasn't anything different than any of the other ones. And... The deal was, the the because the fel the festival setup where each country displays its individual falconry, you know history, mm -hmm. like you know lure stooping for the Brits and the, anyway the Mongolians were there, and they hunt foxes and everything. And the way they train their eagles is pull a, fo a dead fox or a lure behind a galloping horse. Mm -hmm. So it's this big arena, and there's thousands of people watching this thing. And so my job was to walk in the ring, sit over against the fence with Queenie hooded, and she is going to go after a fox lure that we trained her to go after being pulled behind this horse. Mm -hmm. And my buddy, Andrew Knowles Brown, who um, I'll just say his full name so everyone knows, <laughs> his job was to um, handle the lure. So I, Queenie catches it, I trade her off, and the lure is too big for me to handle putting in my bag. So Andrew's come over and hide the lure because Queenie's a little possessive over it. Okay. <laughs> well, Queenie, everything goes smooth, boom, off the fist, grabs the lure. I go over, I trade her off. Well, unbeknownst to me, the, the string pulling the lure gets underneath the horse's tail that the Mongolian's riding. So he's in the process of trying to get himself bucked off because the horse is not happy about this. Mm -hmm. Andrew's trying to get the rope out from underneath the horse's tail. <laughs> I don't know any of this is going on. You know, because I have my back to it. I'm trying to keep Queenie from seeing the fox lure, right? Yeah. Well, just as I go to hood her, she sees it. I only have one Jess in my glove and baits off my fist. So now I'm holding a very upset eagle who's dropped her hood and has a free leg. Hmm. And I lifted her up and tried to get the other Jess. And she, this is in front of everybody. It's on YouTube called Eagle Gets Grabbed by Falcon, or Falconer Gets, gets Grabbed by yeah. Eagle. Somebody filmed it and put it up there. She <laughs> foots me right in my bare arm and buries her talons. You couldn't see any more black talons. It was all the way up to the yellow of her feet. And I'm like, Andrew, Andrew, I don't even, I still don't know what he's doing. I don't even know where he is. Andrew, and all I hear from Andrew is, oh, bloody hell. <laughs> and then the announcer goes, well, there's a trip to the hospital. But... I thought I handled it. He did. He I, I he kept was American very pride. Stoic. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and I just we just backed her off 
And I got her hooded and I walked out of the ring and I didn't scream or cry. <laughs> Did or they throw applause? Myself. Did they give you a round of applause for leaving like an injured athlete? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't, you know, I don't think <laughs> most people even caught on to what happened oh okay that the falconers so, did yeah yeah but, but anyway most so, yeah. of the audience it, i don't think they even sore yeah anyway that was uh that was the gargoyle that's why i changed her name yeah seems pretty <laughs> fitting <laughs> old queenie huh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, thanks guys i still appreciate that <laughs> um so you started in 76 and you guys got married in 76. Yep. So there are some stories that you guys have already told me. Um, when you were training your first imprint, um, <laughs> it would well, react <laughs> It would react in certain ways towards your wife because she was jealous. Hated her. Well, yeah. we got it back up now. We, we uh, raised her in our kitchen. We had a very small house. We, raised, we had a 4x4 a four four square table, our dining room table, kitchen table, and Joe made a nest on the table. It took a lot of convincing <laughs> on my part, but and I finally got her to agree. And it took up the entire table, oh, and huge. that's where um, the eagle lived. And she was just a, a fuzzball when we got her. So, mm. you know, at first it was cute and it was fine and everything. Well, as everyone knows, any raptor in the nest, when they mute, they kind of cock up and... and mm. uh, shoot it out of the nest because they don't want to soil the nest. Well, she was about half grown, just starting to get um, feathers. And one day she, she cocked her butt and shot the mute all the way across the kitchen and splatted it on the toaster. I said, okay, <laughs> that's it. She needs to get moved outside. She, yeah. Oh yeah, she now lives in the barn. Yeah, but no, she uh, was very possessive of Joe. I made every possible mistake you could make oh. raising an imprint bird. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, re <laughs> the reason we got this bird was because a guy we know made films for the Audubon Society. Back then it was all 35 millimeter wind up cameras and all of this. And- That um, was nine millimeter. Nine mil, or, or 16 millimeter. 16, yeah. 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 And the slow motion camera. was, you know, you shoot a <laughs> and then you got to rewind it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't know. I don't anymore. even, yeah. <laughs> I can't relate. I've but never anyway, seen he, that. He, um, he, he, and the Audubon Society mm -hmm. had these lecture circuits where guys would make their own film, high quality stuff, mm -hmm. and then they would send them on these tours, like, you know, 50 cities, whatever. And they would just go from museum to museum, present their film on wildlife yeah. or whatever it was, songbirds, whatever. And this particular guy, Al Wool, loved golden eagles, um, and that's what he kind of loved raptors. So he actually brought us the bird. Okay. So because he wanted, allegedly, yeah, yeah allegedly. <laughs> well, he he wanted to film a golden eagle, and as everyone knows, um, well, and that's why our birds are used in a lot of Nat Geo. I mean, you could sit out somewhere for a lifetime and not get some of the footage that you want. You know, you're just yeah. not like going to get... Like Widow Stooping today. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. never going to get that. Not yeah. in a million years. Yeah, not... But in, yeah. You know, other behaviors, you're just never going to get that close <laughs> to a mm -hmm. golden eagle to even observe it, uh, let alone film it. So that's that was his goal. And um, well, one we of did the, some crazy things. Oh, yeah, things. He did. One of the things yeah. he really wanted to get is, you know, how red tails attack golden eagles or bald eagles, and they roll over in the air and try and foot... Mm -hmm. He really, really wanted that. And I believe he ended up getting it because um, I knew where I could fly her by red tail nest. And, they, and she got actually pretty adept at just rolling over and grabbing the red tail and landing and start plucking. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I saved a lot of red tails, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was she, a pretty impressive thing to see. Yeah. She had it out <clears throat> for, for she red didn't tails. like them, yeah. yeah. This was in California? Where there's yeah. red tails yeah. everywhere? Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere. Same ranch that where the red tails took Thor. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Poor baby. <laughs> Kestrel. <laughs> no. Somewhere I have a picture of me holding that eagle with a red tail that I just saved from her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the red tails, I'm holding the eagle and red, I got the red, and it's looking up like, can anything else possibly be <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously. But, um, uh, I read in one of the articles um, that 
she chased a cameraman down and tried to drown him. <laughs> oh, that's, that's Al. Is that the, the same? Uh, the same guy that um, brought us the eagle. Yeah, we got to well, tell he, this story. Another <laughs> sequence he wanted yeah. is in California, particularly golden eagles eat ground squirrels. You know, the beachy eye, beachy eye, the big ground squirrel. Yeah. And they're and everywhere. They're everywhere, yeah. particularly on our ranch. And so Al wanted to get that sequence. And so I trapped me, myself, us, a couple of ground squirrels. I had to, you know, I had to back up and then the <laughs> yeah. main one and had them in a gunny sack. And um, I w the idea was I was going to walk up a pretty good sized hill and stand on the top. And then Al had his camera set up and there was a canal that runs through the ranch. And so he had his back to the canal and there was a little flat area um, that looked real natural and we had covered up all you know plugged all the holes you know mm -hmm. ground squirrels got to stay on top he can't disappear so the idea was that when everything's ready Cordy's holding the sack and she's <laughs> going to shake the ground squirrel out and then I'm going to unhood the eagle and she, I'd caught a lot of game with her by then so she was pretty dialed in mm -hmm. so you know Cordy waves at me you know we didn't even have walkie-talkies no the thing. we had nothing it was a long ways away anyway <laughs> so I pull the hood and eagles on my and i had really short jesses so at that because he didn't want those showing Man. up on the phone okay so i really had no control over it she's bobbing her head and looking and looking. She just rolls off the fist and i'm like oh man this is gonna be awesome squirrels running around <laughs> and i i'm starting to she's not really going after the ground squirrel and all of a sudden i realized she is in a total mummy tuck fold up going right at al the cameraman and and <laughs> I'm like, I started yelling, but there's no way they could hear me. And Al, mm. something in his, in his brain clicked that something's not going right or something. <laughs> and he looked up, and here's this eagle. And he ran and hook-slided <laughs> into the canal. Yeah. And she just pulled up and landed next to him and was all puffed up. And he was half in the water. <laughs> <laughs> and typical Al Wolf. Well, we got another squirrel. Let's yep. do it again. Yep, we'll do it again. <laughs> so didn't even get phased? No, it didn't <laughs> no. bother him at all. And so I walked back up the hill. I had the hardest part, I'd like to point out, because that was a steep hill. Anyway, I'm up there, and we got the stand-in squirrel, and Cordy shakes him loose, and the eagle's coming for the squirrel this time. Well, the squirrel must have realized it was an eagle there. It could smell it. I don't know what. It starts chasing Cordy, runs up her leg. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. I felt, actually felt so bad. It was... And I'm running away from it, shaking it off the my leg. Coming yeah, like the eagle's coming. Yeah, the coming. She's on and, her way. Um, but in the end, the squirrel got, I got the squirrel away from me. She came and caught the squirrel. Al got his footage. But in the frame, and you wouldn't know it unless you knew this story, uh -huh. you see this cloud of dust right in the frame when, when uh, she caught the ground squirrel. And that was me trying to get away. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh uh, yeah. yeah and actually it worked out great because um I, I released that i left i let her free loft not free loft a hack on the ranch and every day she'd be sitting by our barn and <laughs> i'd feed her something chicken or something whatever and then i wouldn't see her for like three days and she'd come back then i wouldn't see her for three or four weeks and she'd come back and i didn't see her for like four or five months remember that yep and she came back she had another eagle with her wow. was trailing behind yep. her and she just came over buzzed the, the ranch uh -huh. and left so it was a really that good was the, feel yeah, story last time we saw her although during the time that she was <laughs> flying free our neighbor we had cattle and stuff and and my neighbor and i we were riding horseback through the front field of the ranch and we're just riding along bs and as we're going along and i hear this <laughs> i'm thinking and I look up, and here's this female eagle at a dead stoop at the back of the neighbor's head on horseback. Oh, my gosh. And I'm like, oh, I'm duck. I'm waving my hat <laughs> like a big jet. She was just sending a little message. Yeah. <laughs> She's oh. still here. Yeah. <laughs> That's what she used to do to me. Joe yeah. would convince me to go out flying with him, mm -hmm. and she, she hated me. And she would come stooping over me. I'd fall on the ground, you know, on my oh, belly, you know, I'm flat on the ground, you know, covering my head and, um, and she would just, you know, zoom, zoom. And if she had wanted to hurt me, she could, she was just messing with me. But 
and you know, and this is a field. This, there's nowhere to run. There's there's not a fence post. There's no not a trees. bush. You know, I had I had nowhere to hide, so um, I didn't go out very often. <laughs> <laughs> you never got grabbed though. No, no, no. She never wow. did. That's, That's what I mean. I mean, she wasn't serious, but yeah, just sending a message. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like he's mine. Stay <laughs> <away>. <laughs> he's mine. <laughs> that part didn't go over well. <laughs> no. no, she uh, she was quite attached to Joe. Yeah. Mm. Well, she was imprinted. Yeah. <laughs> she liked me. Yeah. 